Good morning. We're at the Air Zoo. It's uh, February the 8th. Uh, we have uh, uh, David Wakefield with us who's going to uh, review uh, with us his experiences before, during, and after World War II. Dave, welcome and tell us a little bit about your background. Well, I was born in 1922 in Poland, Ohio, a little town near Youngstown, on my grandfather's truck farm. And from there, uh, after a few years, uh, moved to the Detroit area in Michigan. Uh, while I was growing up in my teens, I had to quit school for a year and a half to help out a family, and so I graduated from high school about a year and a half later than I should have. But uh, at the time of Pearl Harbor, I was 19. I had just finished high school and was working two jobs. I worked for Swift and Company, the meatpacking people, and I also worked for a trucking company as a billing clerk. And when the Pearl Harbor happened uh, early in the spring of the following year in 1942, I received a letter from my draft board and they told me that I could be expected to be drafted in inside of 60 days. So I decided uh, rather than wait for that that I would go down and, enli and enlist. So I went down to an army recruiting office and walked in and took a number and there were quite a few people ahead of me and I sat down and was waiting my turn and I happened to notice that there were two or three non-coms that were sitting behind me and of course they weren't waiting to be interviewed. They, uh, they were just helping out where they could and they were talking about the different branches of the service. And I heard one of them say that, did you know that uh, pilots get 50% more pay because they consider that hazardous duty and they call it hazardous duty pay. And when I heard that, my ears kind of perked up. I never thought about ever being a pilot, but I got up, threw my number away, and left. And down the street, they had an Army Air Force recruiting office. So I walked in there, and when it finally became my turn, there was a sergeant, he was a tech sergeant, five striper, in charge and sitting behind a desk. When my turn came, I walked up to him, and he says, what can I do for you? And I says, I would like to be a pilot. And he kind of snickered a little bit and uh, he says, well, he says, he says, how much schooling do you have? And I told him that I just finished high school. And he says, well, he says, there's not much chance of you ever being a pilot. He says, because you have to take a written exam and it takes two years of, two years of college before you can actually complete this exam and pass. So I kind of discouraged, I turned around, started to walk away, and then I turned around back again, and I says, by the way, I says, can I take that exam? He says, sure, if you want to take the exam, he says, you can take it right now. We'll be glad to give you the exam. So I took the exam. It was quite lengthy. It took me almost two hours, and uh, after it was all over, it was graded, and he told me that I had failed the exam. And uh, I was kind of disheartened, but I left and I couldn't decide what else to do, so I just left and went back home. And the next day I was surprised because I got a call from an Army major. And he says, Dave, he says, uh, you just took this Army Air Force exam, and he says, you failed the exam, but you just barely failed it. And I was pleased to hear that because they didn't tell me what kind of a grade I'd gotten. He says, uh, he says, we can't send you to pilot school, but he says, how would you like to be a glider pilot? So my first question to him was, do glider pilots get that 50% extra pay? <laughs> and he says, absolutely. And I says, well, if that's the case, count me in. And then they, uh, what they did right away before calling me into the service they started me on what they called a civilian pilot training program. They sent me to the University of Detroit for classes, and then I was taking pilot training at uh, Pontiac Airport, right close by Detroit. 
And they didn't give me a whole lot of time. I think it was something like, oh, like 20, 25 hours, enough to get a private ticket, enough to solo, and do a little extracurricular flying. And then a short time later, they called me to active duty, and I was sent to uh, Lubbock, Texas, at an Army base there for basic training. And it was just a few weeks long, but the thing I remember most there, you did all kinds of jobs there on the base, including KP and everything like that that the new soldier does. And I was working on a road gang one day, and there was about, oh, about 12 of us with shovels, and we were working on this road, and everybody was complaining, you know, this is what we signed up to do, and everybody was complaining and bitching a little bit. The sergeant, he spoke up then, he says, fellas, he says, you guys are just pebbles on the beach of progress. You have no room to talk. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll never forget that statement as long as I live. But uh, when we finished basic training, I was sent to a little town in northwestern Iowa called Spencer. And that's where my pilot training started. We start out, started out in propeller-driven aircraft. They were either, either flew on a Ronca or a Taylor craft. It was propeller-driven. And what they taught you was the basics of flying. And after about uh, 20 hours of that, you were taught something that was going to put you into a category of a glider pilot. You had to practice numerous what they call dead stick landings. And a dead stick landing is when you, when you come into the pattern for your normal landing approach, what you do is turn off the engine. You cut the engine entirely. And it's, then it's a case of uh, knowing where you're at, what your airplane can do, what kind of glide path you can, you can maneuver this airplane into, and then make a landing and hit a certain spot on the field. And you did this day after day after day until you got so you, were, you could really handle an airplane very, very well and put that airplane down just anywhere you wanted to because they always put a stripe across the runway and that's where they wanted you to land and they wanted you to stop within a certain distance. And I can't remember how much time we got there, but uh, when we finished that school, we were shipped to... Uh, La Mesa, Texas, and their glider training started. We flew a glider that was called a TG-5, made by Aranca, and all it was was a regular Aranca airplane without an engine. It had a glide ratio about 7 to 1. Uh, by glide ratio, I mean that if you were a mile high and you had no engine, you could expect to glide for about 7 miles. That's what that ratio, ratio means. And this is what we flew. Uh, we were towed by, um, by Valti BT-13s or uh, North American AT-6s, and they usually towed two at a time, one on a short rope, one on a long rope. And the only difficulty I found in that, after a while your missions kept getting longer and longer, and it was very difficult to handle the glider because you were either on the left side or the right side of the, of the airplane towing you and you had to hold rudder consistently. And long flights were very tiresome on your leg and pilots used to switch their leg holding the rudder on whichever side that, that they were on. The only incident I had there that was caused concern, I did have a forced landing where on takeoff one day two airplanes were being towed and the short rope pilot got into the prop wash and come out on our side of the, on the right side which we were on and we had to cut loose. We landed softly in a cotton field, no problem, nobody was hurt, the airplane wasn't scratched a bit. And, and then from there we went to uh, two bases actually, uh, Big Springs, Texas and Dalhart, Texas. They were bases that were pretty close together and there we got into flying what they considered cargo gliders. The uh, one being used was a WACO 4G or a CG4A. 
At this point in my training, I decided that uh, with the training I'd had besides glider training, which included a lot of infantry training, how to handle all the guns that the Army had available and, and how to handle a platoon and this sort of thing, because when you landed in combat with a glider, you left your airplane, you, be, you became part of the infantry, and you were on your own. This didn't appeal to me, so I went to my commanding officer and we talked it over. I told him I would like to be a power plane pilot. And uh, he was very nice to me. He promoted me to a staff sergeant, which, which was very helpful in the future, and uh, gave me my glider wings and sent me to Kelly Field for classification. That's where pilots were classified according to their mental and physical abilities. At classification, you go through a battery of physical tests, dexterity tests, psychological tests, and you were rated on three possible uh, uh, accomplishments, I, I would say. You could, uh, they rated you as for capability as a pilot, or as a bombardier, or as a navigator. Uh, with the schooling I'd had in the and the uh, pilot training I'd had in the past, I was more than qualified and had no problem with any of the areas. And in fact, uh, I was rated a 10, which is the highest you could get for all three positions, so I had my choice. And of course, my choice was to be a pilot. So from there, uh, my pilot training started in a little town in Missouri called Sykeston. It was called primary training. We flew Fairchild uh, PT-19s, an open cockpit, two-place airplane. The instructor sat in front, or at times he would sit in the rear and let the students sit in front. And there you started your pilot training. It was a uh, aircraft about 200 horsepower, could do very good acrobatics, and it was a lot of fun to fly. And I had no problem and no incidents going through primary training. And from there we went to uh, what they call basic training. My basic training took place in Winfield, Kansas. We were flying Vault T BT-13s, commonly, commonly known as the Vault T Vibrator, and that's exactly what it was. Uh, the airplane I found was a lot more difficult to fly than the PT-19. It was seemingly underpowered and very clumsy, but we battled through it. I had only one incident occur to me while I was going through basic. I was flying solo one day and uh, I lost the engine. The engine on the airplane quit. I was lucky enough to set the plane down in pasture land without any harm to the aircraft. I called a tower on my radio. They sent out a group to pick me up. They sent out a mechanic to fix the airplane, and the instructor flew the airplane back to the base. So there was really no problem. So your glider training stood you in good stead in this incident? Yes, it did, because it was very easy to put that plane down where I wanted to put it down. Mm -hmm. And we finished that training, and then we went to advanced training, and that took place at Foster Field in Victoria, Texas. We were flying the uh, North American AT-6, also nicknamed the Texan. And it was the best experience I had in the service of flying. Advanced training was a real pleasure, just a wonderful thing. The airplanes were very good. They could do just about anything you'd ever want to do in an airplane, and I really enjoyed it. We finished advanced training and was commissioned a second lieutenant, got my wings, and then we had to stay at Foster Field for what they called transition training and gunnery training. Uh, gunnery was done with an AT-6 with a 30 caliber machine gun mounted on the cowl in front of the pilot, and it took place at Matagorda Island out, near, out and over the Gulf so we wouldn't bother anybody. The transition training was the most important part of the training, I thought, because there you were introduced to your first fighter aircraft. Mine was a 
P40 Warhawk, P40 and model Warhawk. And we flew uh, just a small number of hours. I think I flew about 15 hours in the, in the P40. The wonderful thing about transferring from a from a uh, advanced trainer like a T6 that had two cockpits so the instructor could be with you and then you transferred to a fighter plane that only had one cockpit and you often wonder how in the heck can you jump into an airplane that's many times more powerful than what you flew and actually fly that airplane well there was a procedure you went through they had a P40 sitting on the ground that you spent time in the cockpit memorizing the cockpit all the instruments, all the switches, all the handles, until you could actually be blindfolded and have a crew chief stand on the wing with you and ask you to point out different things and you could do it all blindfolded. While you were doing that, you were also reading a manual about the P-40, which told you all about it, all its capabilities, its flaws, if any, and then when you flew it, you tried to find out what these were and flew it until you could handle the airplane like it was supposed to be handled, but that's the way you got into a fighter. Uh, okay, after advanced training then? Uh, after advanced training, there was a uh, waiting period because uh, they have to wait you and get you in a class that's, that's starting at a particular school, so my what I call pre-combat training occurred in Venice, Florida, the Venice Air Base. It was located right on the coast, and we were training in or transitioning in P-40N models, the Which Warhawk. Coast, the east coast or west coast? That would be the west coast. Okay, so yeah, Venice. Out over the Gulf of Mexico. You did most of your flying out over the Gulf, so you wouldn't bother anybody on the land. Uh, I think we got approximately 80, 90 hours of transition training, pre-combat training, which included uh, various forms of uh, formation flying. Uh, we flew the weave, the combat weave. Uh, we done strafing, we done bombing. We done camera gunnery, fighting with each other uh, using cameras. and. Training went very well. The only incident I had was kind of a frightening one initially, but it turned out very well. I was, I was up one day with an instructor, of course he was in a separate plane, and we were doing various forms of formation flying, doing acrobatics, he'd do a loop, I'd do a loop, he'd do an in woman, I would do an in woman. And while you were doing all these things, the, the big thing then is, especially when you were flying formation, you never had the chance to look inside your own cockpit. You had to keep your eye constantly on the, the wing that you were flying. And uh, we were up flying, and it was getting close to an hour, and I happened to look down in the cockpit. And I was really shocked because the entire floor of the airplane was covered with oil. And I looked down at my uniform, and from my chest down, I was soaked with oil, and I never knew it. You could never feel it because when you flew a plane of this type, you're, you're always fully enclosed, including gloves and everything. So the oil was warm, and I actually never felt it all the while we were flying. So I got on the radio and told my instructor what was going on, and he called the tower, and they fixed me up for an emergency landing, and there was no problem. I flew the airplane back to the base, landed, and uh, they checked the airplane over, and apparently the crew chief had forgotten to put the cap on the oil filler. And the oil was blowing out of the filler and through the firewall and into the cockpit. In fact, the oil was so deep on the floor I couldn't even see the gas gauges, which were located on the floor. It was about maybe a couple inches deep. But there was no problem. The only bad thing that occurred about the whole thing was I felt sorry for the crew chief because he was demoted for making such a, such a mistake because it could have been fatal. And after training there, uh, we had to wait a little while and go through some standby uh, 
we were put on standby for uh, moving to another area, and eventually I wound up at in Miami, Florida. Quick question for you. Uh, you've gone through several uh, different stages of training. Uh, you didn't have any really major incidents uh, uh, from your, uh, to yourself. What about uh, any friends or acquaintances? Did uh, uh, during the training was there uh, any? Uh, yes. Uh, major. In in every uh, in every training that I was in in primary, we lost two students. In basic, I think there was either three or four that were lost. Uh, in advanced. I can't recall how many, but there was a few students lost. In, uh, in Venice, Florida, in pilot training, or transition training, pre-combat training in P-40s, we lost two students. It was a very unusual thing because, uh, as I said before, they were practicing, uh, uh, they were practicing um, gunnery with cameras and fighting with each other and taking pictures. And uh, they decided before they took off, these two pilots, they each, each in a different airplane, that uh, they were going to make some head-on passes. And uh, this came up later on when they finally uh, tried to determine what happened to these two pilots. But somebody was sitting nearby and heard one of the pilots say to another, now when we do this head-on pass, he says, I'm going to break left. And he says, you break right. And nobody thought anything about it. And they went up, and this would happen, and of course, yeah. coming at each other, one breaking left, one breaking right, they went head on into each other. Jesus. It was a, just a terrible thing, and nobody thought anything about it, because while they were discussing this, everybody was standing around and never paid any attention. Yeah. So there was no forewarning that they had made a mistake. Huh. Okay, so you're all, all set, you're ready to be shipped overseas. Tell right. Us Oh, that was quite a trip. Uh, we, it was, I forget what the day was, but uh, I was in Miami, Florida, staying in a hotel, and I had turned in, and around 1.30 in the morning, I was, had a knock on my door, and an officer uh, woke me up and told me that uh, I was to get my equipment ready that I was going to leave in, in a couple of hours. And... Uh, I says, where? And he says, well, he says, you won't know that until you get in the air. Uh, they didn't tell you that stuff ahead of time. I would, had been issued all winter clothing, and uh, I felt sure that I was going to go to uh, Europe or England. And uh, we went out to the airfield, and I climbed aboard a C-46. And the airplane took off. I think there was 12 of us on that flight. The airplane took off, and the officer in charge came around and handed us each of one of us our orders, and I couldn't believe what it said. It said that I was going to India, and eventually to China. But the airplane took off from Miami. We flew to Cuba, made a fuel stop, and we went on to Belém, Brazil, and we stayed there for, I think, two days. Then we took off in a B-24 across the Atlantic Ocean. We stopped midway in the Atlantic at an island called Ascension, and then flew on to Accra, Africa, which then was called the Gold Coast. We stayed there for a couple of days, and we got on a C-47, and we flew to Khartoum, and and then to Aden, Arabia, which is all, all the way across northern Africa, to Aden, Arabia, then a long jump to Karachi, India. And they had a pre-combat training base outside of Karachi, India. And I was there for quite a few days. We again got more instrument training. We got more combat training. I got to fly some various aircraft, some of them old, some of them new. Uh, the Curtis P-40N Warhawk was there. I flew an A-36, which was the forerunner of the P-51. 
It was similar to the SBD in that it had uh, dive brakes on it. I flew an RA-24 for instrument flying, which is similar to an, an SBD. And I also got to fly a P-51A model, which was the first model of the P-51, and that had an Allison engine in lieu of the Merlin engine, which came along in later models. Uh, when I finished training there, I got the real surprise of my life. I was told to report to a warehouse in Karachi that was located on the Karachi airport. And when I walked into the, air, the warehouse, I was told to sign a requisition for a brand new P-51C model, which was the latest model at that time. Brand new, just put together, had never been flown. So my pleasure was to get to slow fly that airplane, to break it in, and then, then take it on a flight across India. We left Karachi, and I think our first landing was in Agra. If you know India, that's where the Taj Mahal is located. We had to stop there and see the Taj Mahal. We flew on to, I think it was Andal, India, Tezpur, India, and then into Mohanberry, which was in the Assam Valley. And that was the easternmost point of India, which was uh, north, northeast of uh, Calcutta. That was a jumping off point for the hump. Uh, there I connected with another pilot who happens to belong to the fighter squadron that I was going to be attached to. The two of us took off from the Assam Valley or Mohanberry and flew the hump into Chengkang, China. That was the headquarters of uh, General Chenault and that was where you always reported when you first flew into China. The, the general required that all new pilots had to come in his office, meet him, be introduced, sit down with him, and he talked to you for a little while about what the things you could expect and what he expected of you. It was a real thrill for me because General Chenault was a real big figure in my mind as far as the Army Air Force was concerned. There he told me what fighter group I was going to be attached to, what fighter squadron. And he told me to take my plane, my brand new P-51C, and he says, you take that, and you fly over to Yunnan Yi. He says, you're going to be with the 25th fighter squadron, the 51st fighter group. So the, the pilot I was flying with had been in China before. He, was, he actually made a trip to India just to ferry a P-51 back. So the two of us got on our planes and took off and flew to Yunnan Yi, China, which was not too far away, and landed there. And that became the squadron that uh, I was based with and the squadron that I flew my combat missions with. Very good. When you were flying across India, uh, were you doing the navigating yourself? Were you by yourself or was it a... There was, there was a group of us, but we were flying individually. Okay. We, did, we All fighter pilots did their own navigation. Mm -hmm. we, had the, uh, we had a little device we called an E6B computer that we used yeah. to compute distance and heading with when we were doing cross-country runs. And it was no problem because the weather we run into was excellent all the way across the trip. So it was all VFR flying. Dead reckoning. Dead reckoning, yes. There was no problem. Very good. So you're now assigned to a, a fighter, the, the fighter squadron. Right? Yeah. Did you get to keep your beautiful new P-51? No, uh, I'm sorry to say I didn't. I flew it, flew it in and landed, and those two P-51Cs were the first P-51s that our fighter, fighter squadron got. Uh, the commanding officer and his assistant got those two airplanes and we got to flew something that was a little older. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, tell us about your any combat missions then. That, uh... Well, I think after I joined the squadron, I had some very unusual experiences to start with. We were flying P-40Ns, which was the latest P-40 Warhawk that Curtis was making, 
And initially, uh, there were two pilots to a room. We were in a barracks at Yunanyi. It was a well-established base. And uh, in the first three weeks, of my stay at Yu Nanyi, I had three different roommates. Uh, very unfortunate and left me feeling uh, kind of peculiar, but after that I roomed by myself. Nobody else wanted to come over. They felt I was some sort of a bad omen that come over there. The three guys got shot down or they were, or, uh... they were lost in combat. Huh. And uh, so after that, I roomed by myself. The peculiar thing I noticed that two days after I was with the squadron, I flew my first combat mission. Boy, I was certainly green. It was a, it was a strafing mission, and uh, I made uh, when we reached our target, I made stru two strafing passes. Never fired a shot. Could never fire the, the gun switch. Kept pulling the trigger, but nothing happened. I was really nervous and excited about the whole thing. It was just a complete failure. But uh, that never happened again after that. I sort of settled in after that and things became somewhat, somewhat normal. But a short time later I had a real problem. I uh, was in my seventh mission. It happened on Thanksgiving Day in 1944. I think the date was November 22nd. It was my seventh combat mission, and uh, it was a bombing and strafing mission. Uh, we were bombing a Japanese position, and they were located on a high point of land, so they, they had very good visibility. So we made our bombing run. I made a strafing run. I saw some more targets on my first strafing run, so I decided to make another run, and I didn't vary it enough, and I flew, flew a must have been a hailstorm of fire, and unfortunately, uh, I was flying a plane that had a that was an inline engine. It was liquid cooled, and I was unfortunately uh, one of my coolant lines was hit, and uh, I took out of there. I climbed rapidly and got up to much altitude as I could, but um, I noticed right away that my engine was overheating, and. It was just a few minutes later that the engine started to slow down and was slowly freezing, so there was nothing I could do. I had to uh, bail out. And then my luck really started. I told you I was a very fortunate... It was over enemy territory. It was over enemy territory, yes. So I bailed out and uh, the first thing, uh, as soon as I... Uh, bailed out of the airplane. Well, all I did was I climbed out on the wing, reached back in the cockpit and held a stick to keep the airplane level and then, then I dove off the wing. The damnedest thought went through my mind because uh, as soon as I cleared the tail, I pulled the ripcord and it was located on your chest and I pulled it so hard that it just snapped out into the air and the first thought that went through my mind, well, I pulled it so hard I broke it. But uh, that didn't last too long because the parachute open immediately. It was a very pleasant sensation coming down and the only thing I couldn't believe was how fast it was going when we got close to the ground. I hit the ground so hard I couldn't believe it. It kind of stunned me for a few minutes. And uh, But I unhooked myself right away and left everything right where it was. The airplane crashed a short distance away and, and uh, I knew which direction was home. So I took off on a trot. I was young enough and strong enough, I didn't believe that anybody could ever catch me. And so I just took off running in the direction I thought was home. And after I was on my way for a while, I went through a clearing and looked back and I noticed there was a group of soldiers that were following me. And uh, so I just, just kept moving and thing after a while it finally settled into my mind that uh, these soldiers were not really trying to catch me. They were going at the same pace I was going and there was no shooting. Nobody had a, nobody was aiming a gun at me or anything like that. We were, I would estimate, about a half mile apart. And uh, so I 
just kept moving and they kept moving at the same pace. So I decided to uh, slow down a little bit. I was getting a little tired. So I slowed down and they slowed down, but we kept coming closer and closer together. And, uh, but there was still no animosity on the part of the soldiers part. And uh, so I stopped. This is in China, the, the event? It was in Burma, actually, in Burma. Okay. In Burma. And uh, so I stop. They come up to a certain distance, and they stop. And uh, there was a platoon of soldiers. They were, I think there were 12. And uh, one man who apparently was in charge, he, he came toward me, walked toward me, and I stayed where I was. And uh, the only weapon I had was a 45 automatic. All pilots carried a 45 automatic. He did not have a weapon on him that I could see. So when he got very close to me, I walked out to meet him. And when I got close, it was late in the day. And I could tell immediately that the man was Chinese. And the reason, the reason I was able to tell is because Late in the day, if the man was Japanese, he would have a beard. This man, was, his skin was as smooth as a baby. And Chinese people do not grow beards. Chinese men do not grow beards. They grow goatees and things like that, but they do not grow beards like, like we do. But the Japanese do. And I knew immediately when I got close to this man that he was a Chinese. As it turned out, they were Chinese guerrillas working behind the lines. And... Uh, Talk about luck. Anyway, uh, they took command of me and they took me through the lines, out of Burma, onto the Burma Road. And it was a couple of days later that uh, we were going up the road. We, uh, we came upon a, an American engineering group that were working on the road. And uh, there we parted, these uh, guerrillas and I parted. I gave them all the money I had. You, when, you, when you flew combat, you always carried a money belt with you in case you had to buy your way out of something that, that might help, plus a few other things that you carried. And uh, anyway, we parted company. I gave him all the money I had, and uh, he, uh, he asked me if he could go back and have my parachute. I says, Absolutely. I says, what do you want it for? He says, well, he says, I plan to get married. And he says, I want to use it for my bride's dress. Something else. So uh, we parted company and the American engineering group that was working on a road took me back up the road to the nearest airstrip. I got on a C-47 and flew back to my base at Yunnan Yi and uh, reported to my commanding officer. He sent me over to the flight surgeon for an inspection and uh, he says, I'm sorry Dave, he says, I check you all over. He says, you don't even have a scratch on you. And he says, I can't give you the purple heart. <laughs> and I says, no problem. I said, I'm just glad to be back. Uh, I think two days later I was flying again, flew my next mission. I flew after that, after that mission, I flew another 40 missions, uh, 47 in total. At my 37th mission, I was made a flight commander and was able to lead a few missions before I was sent on my way back home. Very good. Uh, after my combat tour, I was sent back to Karachi, India. They had a flying school there and they were training uh, Chinese students. And it was kind of unusual because they were training these students to fly fighters. They had P-51Ds, the new one. They had P-51Ks. They had, uh, they had a P-47. And that's what we were teaching these students to fly. The difficult part of teaching a Chinese student is that you always had to work through an interpreter. You would tell him what you wanted, and he would tell the students what, what they should be doing. And then you would go out and fly with these. You'd be the flight leader, the instructor would lead the formation, or usually before airplanes, 
two elements of two, and you'd go out and strafe and bomb, and, and then of course fly formation and do acrobatics, this sort of thing, until these students could uh, could fly the airplane. This going through this uh, training here, acting as instructor. Uh, I'm sorry to say that this was the most <sighs> it was. It was it was a very disastrous training section because the students were so poor. Uh, we lost a great number of students there, especially in P-47s. Uh, the the P-47 was very difficult to handle, especially in a dive, and we had several students that go get into a dive and couldn't pull out and would go straight into the ground. That was the most unfortunate thing about the school. And after a little while there, uh, I was sent to Calcutta for the voyage home. Got onto a tro troop ship called the General Muir. And while on that ship, I fell in love with the Navy. I, was, I couldn't believe how nice the quarters were and how good the food was. It was really tremendous. Now, it says you, you left uh, Calcutta uh, September 15th, 45. Yeah. Uh, this is after the atomic bomb had been dropped. And that was after the war was over. Okay. Yes. Uh, what was your reaction when you heard about uh, the the bombs and the fact that the war was over? Uh, well, we, we had. If a, it hadn't been over, you'd have, would you have stayed there and been involved in the invasion of uh, Japan? The uh, we, we, I really don't know. I couldn't tell you. The only thing is, while I was doing this instruction work with. Uh, Chinese students, uh, we received word that the war was over and we had a big celebration except that the training went on because these Chinese students uh, were probably going to be prepared for something else in their future. Okay. So just a great big celebration. Great big celebration, yes. Mm -hmm. So you're going, coming home by boat? Uh, took, yes, it took 30, uh, I think 30 days to go from Calcutta to New York City. Uh, we went around India, around Ceylon, through the Indian Ocean, through uh, the Suez Canal, through the Red Sea, of course, and the Suez Canal, and then the Mediterranean, and uh, out into the Atlantic. And the weather got pretty rough out there, but uh, and on a troop ship, that's a bad thing. I felt sorry for the all the soldiers in the hold. The, the ship was loaded with people. You were an officer, so you got the, the better. I had a real, I had a beautiful stateroom. I hate to say it, but I did. <laughs> <laughs> it was very comfortable. And of course, when the weather was rough, you could always go into mess hall and eat whatever you wanted. I never got sick on a boat or anything like that. So, the mess hall, usually during rough weather, was deserted. Mm -hmm. But those sailors really ate. I'll tell you, the food was great. Okay. And then uh, we landed in New York City, greeted very warmly by a lot of people. Uh, we went to, a, uh, to an army base close by, had a wonderful dinner. I liked the service so well, I signed up again for another year. Went home on a long furlough and was discharged in, I think, 1946. I can't remember the month. Was discharged in 1946. And, uh, but I really liked the military. When I got home, I started looking at the National Guard. I looked at the Air National Guard in Michigan, and they weren't doing too much, didn't have anything to fly, and I went to the Army National Guard. They had a lot of airplanes. They were very busy and, and uh, doing a lot of work, so I joined the Michigan National Guard, and the unit was the 182nd Field Artillery Battalion. When I come home, I was a first lieutenant. I had to revert to a second lieutenant because I changed service. But I got to fly every time I wanted to and uh, became a forward observer and a forward fire direction pilot, which was a lot of fun. It was a great learning experience. And I st stayed with that for as long as I was in the Guard, except for the last few years. They changed the situation a little bit, 1962. When I was 40 years old, I decided to go to helicopter school. I went to uh, Fort Walters in uh, Mineral Wells, Texas, 
went to helicopter school. Greatest thing I ever did because at that time I was thinking about retiring. So after I went to school and I come back and we were flying helicopters, I was really enjoying myself. So I stayed in for another four years. And uh, retired in 1966. At that time I was a senior pilot and a major. Very good. You got to fly helicopters, virtually any kind of fixed wing that the Army had? Well, they were at that time getting rid of fixed wing airplane and more and more helicopters. So I flew the same hel helicopter that I flew in uh, helicopter school, the Hiller H-23. They had uh, C models at school, which were the later models, and uh, our guard unit had A and B models, which were very similar but slightly less powerful. And then a short time later, we got in Bell Hueys that, that was used in Vietnam, and that was a wonderful helicopter to fly. You uh, were in the Guard during the Korean War period. Was there any uh, uh, question of being brought, pulled up? Uh, some of our units were called up during Korea. They just didn't happen to call our field artillery unit. But uh, two field artillery units from Michigan Guard went to Korea. Okay. Uh, what about other things after uh, uh, the war? Did you take advantage of the GI Bill? Uh, 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 no, uh, I was in kind of a peculiar situation. I was a foster child living with foster parents, and when I come home from overseas, these are the parents I reverted to, and, uh, and uh, the first thing I did was talk to my foster father, who was a grand man, or just a great grand guy, and he was working at the Ford Motor Company. And he was telling me how wonderful it was and uh, how great the union was. And I didn't have any love for unions. And he told me how I could never get a job at Ford Motor Company. And just for kicks, I went out and one day and applied for a job. And I did get a job. But I only worked for two weeks, and I quit. And I was working midnights. Uh, they wanted me to join the union, but I refused. And... <laughs> and uh, they tried to get me to stay, but I decided to do something else. I uh, went to work for a paint company, Acme Quality Paint Company, and uh, was which was located in Hamtramck, and worked there for a number of years. Met my wife there, or the woman that I married. Got married, and uh, then I decided after a while of that, I. Uh, Decided to go back to school. I went to uh, electronics school. Went to work for an electronics company after that. Worked there for a while doing inside work. And then I decided to become a uh, manufacturer's agent. Went to work for a small company. Worked for a few years, bought the company, and retired from that company. Okay. That was my uh, second retirement. <laughs> Sounds great. Yeah. Overall, your time in the military, uh, what uh, uh, were you pleased with it? Would you do it again? You know, it's, uh, in an instant. I thought the military was great. Not, not all pilots or people I was associated thought that about the military, but uh, it's certainly not for everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a kind of a restrictive life. It was very restrictive during the war. I understand today it's a lot less so. But uh, it's a life that is not for everybody. It has to be uh, your type of living. But I, I thought the military was just great. I loved the years in the National Guard. They treated me very well. I had a, uh, a nice job. In fact, it was the best part-time job I ever had. I spent a great deal of that time just flying uh, brass around the state of Michigan and outstate. It was a very enjoyable time. Great. While you were in Burma, uh, did you have any contact with the uh, local population? Uh, uh, any R&R, &R or, uh, or did they stick, keep you stuck to the air bases? Well, I was, I was, we, we flew into Burma, but we were never stationed there. We were always come out of uh, China. China. Yeah, and uh, so China. the local people there, I met um, two English missionaries that I thought were very nice people. They were over there doing missionary work in China. Uh, 
The Chinese people that I met, the women still bound their feet. They walked around like they were on stilts. Uh, the, uh, we felt we liked the missionaries so well that uh, I made one memorial trip. I, I got a rest leave from China and I uh, flew to uh, Calcutta. And when I was going on this trip, uh, all the other pilots got together. We all got together any time a pilot went on rest leave and if we wanted him to pick up anything for us in Calcutta, well then we would give him the money and he'd do that. So that's what I did when I got to Calcutta. I had a bunch of money with me and it was used to buy canned goods, generally fruit, and also liquor. And you could, uh, on the black market in Calcutta, you could buy any kind of liquor you wanted. So I bought considerable amount of liquor and considerable amount of canned goods and uh, had that carted out to the airport when I was ready to go back to China. And uh, I was flying a P-40, P-40N. And uh, the uh, men working with me, the enlisted men working with me to pack this stuff in the airplane they had no place to put the stuff. So uh, I told them to open all the wing wells, take out all the ammunition, and uh, put all this stuff in there, and they did. They packed it very well, packed it in newspaper and cloth and that sort of thing. So when I flew back to China, I flew by myself. But when I, when I took off to go back, I was flying this P-40 and the weather was real bad. And uh, I w was kind of undecided whether I would take off or not because it was really closed in. And uh, there happened to be in the operations office when I was ready to leave a pilot that was flying a B-25. And he was headed in my general direction. He was going to a different place, but for a while we could be flying together. So I talked to him for a bit and I asked him if I could fly out and get under his wing because his instrumentation was a lot better than mine. So he took off, and I took off right after him, climbed under his wing, and he took me over the hump. And on the other side of the hump, the weather was beautiful. So uh, we waved goodbye to one another, and I took off where I was going, which, which was Peo Shan, China. And uh, it was a forward base. I'd been gone about 10 days, and when I got near my base, we could always call a, an RDF unit, radio direction finder unit. So I called the station, identified myself, and he gave me a heading to, to the base. And I flew that heading. And he says, well, you're right over the base. I looked down and I couldn't see an airfield at all, anywhere. And uh, I flew around there and made circles, descended and looked all over the area and I couldn't see an airfield anywhere. They had, that thing was really camouflaged very well. So they sent up a plane to get me down. They were concerned about the load I was carrying and uh, the plane took me down, we landed and everybody had a good time. And most of the fruit, the canned fruit, went to the two English missionaries that were acquainted with our base. But it was uh, liquor, very unusual. The liquor stayed with the... With the liquor, the liquor stayed with the pilots, yes. <laughs> yes. That's one thing that they did uh, that I didn't mention. Uh, when you were flying combat, after every mission you flew, you got uh, four ounces of liquor. They gave you that. What I used to do was get an empty bottle and kept pouring it in. When it got full, I sold it. <laughs> I wasn't a drinker at the time. But those are some of the unusual things that happen. Well, very good. Any final words, uh, comments on uh, the current situation in the country regarding patriotism? Or? Well, it's kind of discouraging, uh, this thing, patriotism. Uh, it's not like it was during World War II. I mean, when patriotism was very high by almost all the population. Um, today, I go and watch my grandson play basketball. He plays, he plays basketball for one of the high schools close by here. And uh, I am appalled when they play the national anthem before the game how many people just stand there with their hands in their pockets, and I'm talking like 95% of the people just stand in lounge. They don't know the slightest thing what to do when they hear the national anthem. It's, but it's a, it's a general trend. That's people today. It's not like it was during, yeah. during the 40s. 
Well, Dave, uh, thank you very much. It was a great session. Uh, any final comments? No. Yep. The only thing I can say is uh, if you're a young man and you think you'd like the military, I thought it was a wonderful life. And if I had to do over again, I'd do exactly the same thing. Very good.